Okay, good morning. Uh, today, we're going to prove two theorems in complexity theory. So I feel like, you know, we've been doing a lot of, you know, definitions and explanations and setup and so forth. And, uh, you know, today's actually going to be a little bit different. Uh, you know, we're just going to prove two theorems. And um, both are kind of classics in complexity theory. They're kind of like the stuff that was being done in like the 70s and 80s. So it's like a little bit retro, but um, Ladder's theorem I talked about last time, it's this actually good theorem to know that says, assuming P is not NP, uh, it's not the case that every language is either NP complete or in polynomial time. So Ladner's theorem tells that this, this world is not the real world. You know, there are some NP complete problems, these are like the hardest, pro hardest problems in NP. And there are some polynomial time solvable problems, these are like easy problems in NP. But Lattner's theorem tells us that there are also some problems that are neither. They're in the middle, maybe they're NP intermediate. So they're not in P, but they're not as hard as all the problems in NP. So we'll see the proof of, uh, well, we won't quite see the proof of this today. We'll see a proof of a slightly weaker form of Ladner's theorem. It captures all of the ideas, I think, but to really prove Ladner's theorem, it's a bit of a tricky, tricky proof. So we're going to um, skip that. We're also going to see this other theorem called Mahaney's theorem, which on one hand, I think it's like not the most important like theorem in complexity theory, but um, I wanted to give you an example of you know like you know a proper theorem that you know it's about complexity theory, like you know, you know actually takes a somewhat substantial proof, but it's not too tricky. So um, yeah, these are the two theorems I want to tell you about today. <coughs> okay, good. So Ladner's theorem. This is the one we want to prove today uh, in the first half of the lecture. So we're trying to you know, find this uh, you know, interesting language L that, first of all, it's you know, not a crazy language. It's not like it's a uh, um, you know, halting problem or something. It should be in NP. Um, not NP, but also not as hard as every language in NP. So OK, some kind of uh, intermediate level problem. And the trick for, oh, I should mention, good, uh, before I get started, this is not the full theorem that we'll prove, as I mentioned. We'll prove a little bit of a weaker theorem. Um, instead of assuming that P does not equal NP, we're going to make this a stronger assumption that I've talked about a few times called the exponential time hypothesis. This is a stronger conjecture than P does not equal NP. So, you know, because of NP completeness, we know that this question is the, or this statement, P does not equal NP, is the same as saying that 3SAT is not solvable in polynomial time. And the exponential time hypothesis says that actually 3SAT is not even solvable in sub-exponential time. You know, uh, you're not, you can't do it in 2 to the root n time or 2 to the n to the 0.99 time. In fact, there's some number like 0.001 such that you can't even do it in 2 to the 0.001 n time. So it's definitely a stronger hypothesis. Uh, we kind of believe it's true. So I'm going to show you a proof of Ladner's theorem assuming uh, ETH. And actually, once we finish the proof, we'll see that you can you don't need even an assumption that's as strong as ETH. You can get away with an assumption which is just a little bit stronger than P does not equal NP. Great. So what is this mystery language going to be that is not solvable in polynomial time, uh, but also not uh, hard enough to be NP complete? And the proof We'll use the following language based on this idea of padding that we saw last time. So what we're going to do basically is take a hard problem, uh, specifically 3SAD, because we're going to operate under this ETH assumption. So 3SAD is, you know, under this assumption, a very hard problem. But we're going to kind of water it down like halfway so that with this padding technique to make the input length kind of artificially longer so that it'll give like some extra time to the algorithm. Um, but not so much time that like it can you know solve it in in polynomial time, but also um, well you'll see and enough time that kind of makes its difficulty somewhere in the middle between exponential time and polynomial time. Okay, so without further ado, here's what the language is going to be. Uh, in quotation marks, I'll say it's three sat padded to length. 2 to the square root n. Well, I put that in quotation marks. Let me give it like a proper definition now. Well, this is the idea you should have in your head. Let me say it's the language of all strings that look like x, kind of a real input, followed by like a bunch of ones, like artificially tacked on, 
And let me put in 2 to the square root of the length of x. And uh, yeah, let me leave it like that. Okay, such that x is in 3 side. Okay, so L consists of all the strings that look like a three side formula that is satisfiable, followed by like a bunch of junk of length equal to basically two to the uh, root of the input length x. So as I said, the function of this, like adding this junk, is sort of to artificially give more time to uh, an algorithm trying to solve three sets. But we're not going to put in enough junk that like, you know, it's going to be able to just run an exponential time algorithm on this part. OK, so this choice of 2 to the root n is kind of cleverly chosen to be between polynomial and fully exponential. OK, so this is going to be our uh, language. And there are three things to check. I mean, they're right there in the statement of the theorem. OK, so first thing to check is that n, oh, sorry, l is in np. All right, so uh, can somebody tell me why this is true? Yeah. Um, OK, so what should the verifier do? Mm, kind of, yeah. Um, I think it's easier to prove this one is in LP NP using the non-deterministic polynomial time Turing machine idea. But we can do a verifier proof if you like. Uh, well, so if we wanted to find a verifier V, it takes two inputs. Let me call its inputs. It's a bit misleading because this is x. So let's call its input w and z. So what should what should it do? <coughs> yeah. Let's check the w's of that one. Great. I'll put you on pause for a second. Right. So it's trying to check the w is in this language. So the first part is it'll check that w is indeed of the form x followed by this many ones. Let's say 2 to the root n for x equals n, right? If it's not of this form, then it just can reject. That w is not in the language. Now? And then check that uh, z is a satisfying example for the, for the, uh, for, for the x part. Yeah, it's, I guess it's all doubly confusing because now I'm using x to stand for a three side input. It's supposed to be a formula. Well, you guys can survive. So, uh, yeah, check. Well, like interpret Z as a truth assignment for the 3 CNF formula F, oh, sorry, X, and, you know, accept if and only if Z satisfies X. It's a little bit funny that X is standing for a formula, but it's okay. Uh, good. So this, uh, I have to check that it's in NP, or sorry, that this decides the language, sorry, that this verifies the language. Uh, and it's true if you have a string w that's in the language, uh, and you give it a satisfying truth assignment for the short part x, it's in this form, then this verifier will accept. And if the string is not in the language, it means either that it's not in the proper form, so the verifier will reject at this point. Um, or it is in this proper form, but uh, there'll be no, if it, the x is not in three side, it's unsatisfiable, there'll be no truth assignment z that'll make the verifier accept. OK. And I suppose you have to also check that this is in polynomial time. This part is kind of a, a more or less linear time. You just kind of look at the input and check that it has the right number of ones. I guess you have to kind of compute this, so that might take a little extra time. And this is linear time. OK, great. OK. Got 
that was the easy part. Uh, all right, so we got this part. Step two is that the language is not in polynomial time. OK, well, uh, we're going to have to use something here. Normally, we're not very good at proving languages cannot be solved in polynomial time. But luckily, we have something to go on here. We have this. We're assuming the exponential time hypothesis. So we know, for example, that 3sat cannot be solved. Not only in polynomial time, it can't be solved even in any time that's like essentially smaller than 2 to the n. Anything that's 2 to the little o of n. Good. So, well. Uh, how are we going to do this? Assume for contradiction that you can solve L in polynomial time. That there's some algorithm A deciding L in time, well, polynomial time. I'm going to do a slightly unusual thing, and I'm going to write capital N for the length of its input. So let's say in time order n to the c on uh, length n inputs. OK, so imagine that on inputs, you're trying to decide if they're in L, this algorithm A can do it rather efficiently. You know, it's always when, you know, trying to decide if a string is an L, like sort of the easy part, the trivial part, is like checking that it has the appropriate number of ones at the end. And like the, the hard part is deciding whether the sort of the real input at the beginning is in 3sat or not. Um, okay, any ideas for what should we should do next? Yeah, perfect. That's the exact strategy. Somehow use A to solve just three sat in sub exponential time, contradicting this ETH. So good. How to do that? Telling me an algorithm right now? That's okay. I mean, uh, all right. Yeah, so good. So we're trying to, uh, you know, we only have one thing to go on here. We're going to try to get a contradiction to this hypothesis. So we're going to try to get a fast algorithm for 3sat. So, I mean, the next line I have to write here is, here's an algorithm for 3sat. So, like, let's define an algorithm for 3sat. Algorithm A prime for 3sat. On input x, again, this is a potential input for 3 sets, so it's a little weird that I started calling it x, but that's okay. On input x of length n, okay, we're trying to, you know, you can interpret it as a 3 sat formula. Uh, 
OK, well, we're trying to decide if it's in 3SAT. Luckily, we have this algorithm uh, A that decides a language L, which is very similar to 3SAT. So what do we do? We form Y, which is X, followed by like the appropriate number of ones. Oops. OK, and how much time does that take? Well, I guess we have to compute the appropriate number of ones. But like, you know, computing square root of n is, I don't know, poly time and little n. But the main work is just literally writing down all these ones. So I mean, the time is roughly 2 to the square root n. Maybe a little bit more, but not much more. OK. And now we run A on Y, and output its answer. Okay. So I claim that this correctly, A prime, correctly decides 3SAT. So why is that? Yeah? Because A is an algorithm for um, L and L, and L, if L is a form x1 to the root n, then x is in 3 side. That's right. So I mean, uh, the input that we're always plugging into A is sort of always in the, this like artificially uh, padded form. Yeah. So like that condition of being in L will check out. Mm -hmm. So then whether or not this y is in L will just boil down to exactly whether or not x is in 3 side. So great. A prime correctly decides 3 side. And what is the time of the running time of A prime on length n inputs? Well, as we said, it's you know about two to the root n to form y. Okay, now let me invent some notation. Let capital N be uh, two to the root n which is basically the length of y. Okay, it's a little bit bigger than this, but maybe it's almost like two times that or something. And then we run A, and we know something about the running time of A. If you give it a length capital N input, it runs in polynomial time in length capital N. So we're giving it a two to the root n time, uh, two to the root n length input. So, and to run A, the time is order this capital N, so some constant C, which is, you know, order about 2 to the root N to the C. And this is a constant, it just comes down here. So it's like 2 to the big O of root N. Okay, so therefore, we've got an algorithm that decides 3SAT in time 2 to the order root n. But this is much, much smaller than, you know, uh, any 2 to the delta n. Okay, so I mean, the three, uh, exponential time hypothesis says any algorithm for 3SAT has to take something like 2 to a constant times n time, and magically somehow we're doing it in time 2 to the constant times root n time. So this contradicts. ETH. Okay. Great. So now we've shown that L is not in P. Okay. So we have this language L. It's in NP. And it's not in polynomial time. And the last thing we have to show is this that it's not NP complete. So I hope you remember ETH. So 
come to the point is it's going to be too easy to be NP complete. But L is not NP complete. Well, as always, we can write the first line of the proof without thinking at all. Now assume for the sake of contradiction that it is NP complete. This is the same as if and only if it's NP hard, because we already know it's in NP. So whether or not it's NP complete boils down to whether or not it's NP hard. So let's assume for a contradiction that it's NP hard. Okay, so what does that mean? So it means that every language in NP reduces to it in polynomial time. So let's pick our favorite language, 3SAT. So 3SAT reduces to, in polynomial time, L. So it means if you want to solve 3SAT now, you know, by a polynomial time transformation, it'll suffice for you to decide whether or not a string is in L. So now how are we going to get a contradiction? Some of the right ideas. We are going to try to use this to get a, a, an algorithm for 3SAT that's too fast. But uh, the first thing you said is unfortunately like sort of exactly wrong. So I mean, uh, we just finished showing that L is not in polynomial time. So we don't have a polynomial time algorithm for P. However, it's the right idea. Um, there is a pretty good algorithm for a pretty fast algorithm for solving L. So this is a good question. How fast can you solve L? Yeah? So if you just check all the segments by brute force, it's going to take you some exponential time for L. That's right. So although we cannot solve L in polynomial time, you know, we kind of made this like watered down version of SAT. So it's not in polynomial time, but also it's not, doesn't take fully exponential time to solve either. So let's in fact figure this out. Like how fast can we solve L? And then we'll actually use the, the idea that was mentioned that like once L can be solved pretty fast and we have like efficient out reduction for reducing 3SAT to L, that means we can solve 3SAT like unusually fast, again in contradiction to the exponential time hypothesis. Good. So how fast can we solve L? Let's say on length n inputs. But let me, again, suspiciously write capital N for the input lengths. So let's answer this question. And uh, there's a pretty uh, straightforward algorithm for L. You know, given a string y, you know, uh, of length n, you know, first check it's of the form, you know, x followed by the appropriate number of ones. OK, and this takes time. This part is not very hard. You just have to check, count that there's sort of the right number of ones at the end. So this takes time, I don't know, order n or something. Maybe a little bit bigger than order n. And then you can figure out what x is. And now the only thing you have to check is whether this like really short part of the input x is in 3SAT. So, you know, get the sort of quote unquote real input x of length n, little n. And now let's try to understand what is the relationship between little n and big n. 
So we know that I'm ignoring like a small constant factors for like you know the encoding and stuff, but that doesn't make a big difference. So we know that basically capital N is like two to the root little n, maybe plus n or something, but this is much, much smaller than this. So let me just write that. So how can we solve this to get, express little n as a function of big N? Whenever you have a situation like this, just like keep taking logs until it looks simpler. So uh, let's take the log one time. We get like log n is basically root n, root of little n. Okay, and so n is little n is log of capital N squared. Okay, so as a function of the length of this big string, y, that's the real input, well, it's the input, the, the part that we want to check if it's in three side is actually very short. It's like a polylogarithmic in the long input length. It's log squared. Great, so as mentioned, now we can just do the brute force algorithm for three set on x. So now I just check if x is in three sets by the brute force algorithm of trying all assignments. OK, the time for that is basically 2 to the little n. Again, maybe times polynomial and little n, but this is going to be very small, as you'll see. But what we know is that you know, this is 2 to the log of big N squared. OK, and you know, you, if you don't have practice with this, you might not immediately see it. But this is the same as n to the log n. Because this is log n times log n. I can sort of bring one of the logs down in the two to make a capital N. So remember, this is like the, the, the length of the input uh, that we're measuring our running time in terms of capital N. So we actually decided, what we've just shown here is that capital L on length n inputs is decidable in not too much time, actually. Time, you know, I cheated a couple times with some constant factors. So let me just be a little bit safe and put a big O up here. And that's very small. So I mean, this is not a polynomial time algorithm for L, but it's pretty close. It's like n to the log n. That's quasi-polynomial time. Is that okay? So this day, maybe start to see the whole point of defining L in this way. Mm, you kind of like made a watered down language that like it's not solvable in polynomial time, but it's solvable in a little bit more than polynomial time. Great. So now we're almost done. Now we know that L can be solved quite efficiently. We know that 3 sat can be reduced to L very efficiently. We just have to put those together and deduce that 3 sat can be solved pretty efficiently. Not in polynomial time, but way less than 2 to the n time. OK, so now, uh, OK, so by our 3 sat reducing in polynomial time to L reduction, what does this mean? So you have an input here, x of length n, and then you reduce it to a potential input for L, let's say y of length, well, it's a polynomial time reduction, so this will be, you know, order n to the c for L. And so we can decide if a length little n string is in 3 sat by first running this polynomial time reduction, and now doing our somewhat efficient algorithm for L on this string. So therefore, we can decide 3 sat on length n, little n inputs in time. Well, polynomial time to first run the reduction. And then we get a string whose length is at most little n to the c. And then we can plug that in as capital N in this running time. So it'll be like, you know, n to the c times big O of log of n to the c. That's this running time, expresses a function of the length of the input to L. 
And this log of n to the c is not a big deal. This c would come out down here, and we get like n to the order c squared log n. But this c is still just a constant, so this is n to the order log n. OK, so by virtue of the fact that capital L could be solved in quasi-polynomial time, and that 3sat reduces to L, 3sat can also be solved in quasi-polynomial time. The constant will be bigger here than it is here, but it just changes this. Uh huh. How can we say that in the wise of length over the n to c if it's in this form of you know, this 2 to the n? Yeah, so I mean, we're using the assumption that there's a polynomial time reduction from 3 sat to L. So it, uh, it takes an input of some length n. And we don't know how it works. So who knows what crazy things it does. But somehow it produces a string, y, or I can call it z if you like, uh, that's in L if and only if x is in 3 sat. So who knows how it works. In fact, it probably doesn't exist since this is all in a proof by contradiction. Um, but it does something. and. It's a polynomial time reduction, so the reduction algorithm only has time to output a string that's of most polynomial length. So somehow, like it would be outputting a string. Uh, presumably, if it's doing something sensible, it will be outputting a string that's in this like padded form. So somehow, it would maybe be outputting a string whose like real input is like maybe logarithmic in length, and then it has like all these ones. And you know, essentially, that's sort of supposed to be impossible. So maybe you get the, the feeling from this that, you know, given a three-side input, you cannot convert it to like an equivalent three-side input that's like logarithmically shorter. But um, yeah. Uh, great. And so finally, three-side, this is under the assumption that three-side reduces to L. We've solved three-side in quasi-polynomial time, which again contradicts ETH. Okay, and this is finally the end of, uh, well, Ladner's theorem. Except that we didn't quite prove Ladner's theorem. We used uh, a slightly stronger hypothesis. We assumed that uh, ETH rather than P does not equal NP. Okay, so as I you know, promised you last time, this language we eventually constructed that is not in polynomial time and not NP complete, I promised you it was like not very natural. Like there's uh, you know, it's not like maybe the most enlightening thing. It was like three sat with like some junk at the end to make it like artificially somewhat easier in terms of running time and the length of the inputs. But it's a good fact to know. Any questions? This part? Um, because uh, our algorithm, I didn't fully write it out, I suppose. We're designing an algorithm for three sat on length little n inputs. And the algorithm has two steps. First, run this supposedly existing reduction to get L. And that outputs, and then run, the, run this algorithm for the input to L. So the, when we run the reduction, we'll get a, like a slightly longer string. It'll be length like n to the c. And now, like, that's like our capital N. So like, I plugged n to the c into this running time. So it's like n to the c to the order log of n to the c. OK. So um, that's the end. But actually, I want to talk a little bit about um, uh, how to make a stronger version of this theorem and like go towards the proper version where instead of assuming the exponential time hypothesis, you just assume that p does not equal np. So uh, we used the exponential time hypothesis twice in this proof, actually. So we used that 3 sat is not in time 2 to the delta n twice. First, we used it when we showed that L is not in P, um, because if L were in P, then we could solve 3 sat in time something like 2 to the root n, which uh, is smaller than this. And then we also used it when we were showing that L is not NP complete, 
Because we said, well, if it were, there'd be a reduction from 3 sat to L. L can actually be solved pretty fast. And then we would get a pretty fast algorithm for 3 sat, which uh, would contradict this. Now, I want to like, note one thing I said here. We actually use one more thing about 3 sat. Um, it was in this last part where uh, we did this. So we said, oh, if you had a reduction from 3 sat to L, uh, you could solve 3 sat fast if you could solve L fast. And we used the fact that L could be solved pretty fast. And inside it, we used the fact that 3 sat could be solved in 2 to the n time. So actually, I just want to point out that we used this assumption twice. And we also used a trivial fact that 3 sat is in time, I don't know, let me just say 2 to the order n. And if you think about the proof for a while, what we really needed was just these two facts that like this was that we had some lower bound on how much time sat took. And also we needed like an upper bound on it that was not too far away from the lower bound. So in fact, I won't do this, but if you just like run through the proof again, um, I'll, I'll tell you that like a similar proof works if for example, you knew that, um, let's say you knew that 3 sat was not in 2 to the n to the point 0, 01 time. Uh, as long as you knew that like 3 sat was in not too much more time. Let's say 2 to the n to the point 1 time. So what I'm saying is, suppose like you, uh, you know, don't like this assumption of the ETH, and you're like, I really would only like to assume, I don't want to make this, I don't want to make this strong assumption that SAT cannot be solved in, you know, sub-exponential time. Because you're like, maybe it can be solved in, I don't know, maybe it can be solved in time 2 to the n to the point 0.1. That would still be OK. So I mean, as long as like the, as long as you had some knowledge of the best running time for 3 SAT, like maybe it can't be done in this much time, but it can be done in this much time. Then you just put these two things together. There's one twist. You have to like pick a padding length that's somehow just in the middle. So I think for this one, like, you know, you pad instead of from length n to like two to the root n, you can pad from length n to n to the log n or something. And if you go home and like check the numbers, then the similar proof will work if this is the case with a differing amount of padding. And you might say, well, but perhaps. You know, this is not true. Maybe 3 sat can be solved in, I don't know, quasi, quasi polynomial time. But actually, a similar proof still works if, let's say, you know that 3 sat is in order n to the log n time, but not in, I don't know, n to the order log n over log log n time. So here I just like picked some amount of time that maybe 3 sat can be solved in. And then I just said, let's imagine you can solve 3 sat in that much time, but like a little bit less time, you can't solve 3 sat. If that were the true, like, true state of affairs about 3 sat, then you can actually do the same proof. You have to like maybe pad to a different amount again to like, I don't know, like n to the root log log n or something. But the same proof will work. You'll like say, You'll construct a language L that's like 3 sat, but padded a little bit. You'll show that um, that language can't be in polynomial time, because then you would be able to solve 3 sat faster than this. And that language uh, can't be NP complete, because if it were, you'd have a reduction from 3 sat to that language. And then you could solve that language using a 3 sat algorithm this time. And then you'd end up solving sat faster than this time and so forth. So what am I telling you here? What I'm telling you here is like kind of an amazing uh, fact, which is you know, we started by making the assumption that we believe that 3 sat can not be solved in exponential, sub-exponential time, can be solved in exponential time. And we deduced Ladner's consequence. But the same proof basically works if you just know the best running time for sat. If you happen to know that like the fastest sat algorithm runs in time 2 to the n to the point 1, you, know, you can do it in this much time, but not a little bit less. You can do the proof. If you know that there's a 3 sat algorithm, the fastest 3 sat algorithm is n to the log n time. You can do it in n to the log n time, but you can't do it in like this amount of time. You can do Ladner's proof. 
In fact, any running time, like if you can, that's more than polynomial. If you can do three sad in that amount of time, but you can't do it in a little bit less time, then you can prove Ladner's theorem. Now that looks actually funny because uh, why don't we just, I mean, why doesn't that complete the, the whole story? Like, why cannot we just say, you have to take my word for it that the numbers check out, but you might say, why can't I just say, okay, let's assume P does not equal NP. We want to get the conclusion of Ladner's theorem. Just let T of N be the fastest running time for 3SAT. And then, you know, assume T of N is bigger than a polynomial because P does not equal NP. And then, um, yeah, then you can do this argument if you pad to like just the right amount. The reason that doesn't work, the only problem with this proof strategy is this. 3SAT might not have a fastest algorithm. So if 3SAD like, you know, had a fastest algorithm or like a more or less fastest algorithm, this proof strategy works. The reason you cannot like just prove Ladner's theorem based on that idea is this. 3SAD might not have a fastest algorithm. What do I mean by that? For all we know, it's possible that Let's say 3SAT is not in P, but 3SAT is in um, n to the order log n time. And it's also in n to the order log log n time. And it's also in n to the log 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 time. And it's also in n to the four logs time. And it's also in n to the five logs time. And so forth. That would be pretty crazy. Um, but it could be true as far as we know that like there's no polynomial time algorithm, but like for any number of logs, you can do it in like n to that many logs time. That would be like truly insane, but uh, we don't know how to disprove that. And so therefore, like, you cannot prove Ladner's theorem by just saying, like, OK, like, tell me the, let's assume p does not equal np, so sat is not, 3sat is not in polynomial time. Just tell me like, the fastest running time for 3sat, and then I'll do this padding argument. Unfortunately, that does not work because uh, this is a possibility. So what does it mean for something that continuously, like, shouldn't there just be one the lower bound that's going to make it one omega and how is this? I mean, uh, it's probably not true, but it's possible. I mean, well, why would it not stop for properties about it? Would make it it's hard for me to answer the question because, I mean, it's like asking about something that's probably not true. But I mean, I mean, uh, it could be true. Like, why? Why could it? I mean. How, how can we know that it's not true? I don't know. I mean, you just have, like, you design a different algorithm. In fact, uh, you can actually, uh, you can actually create art, like crazy artificial languages that have exactly this property. So in fact, this kind of thing can be true. We don't believe it's true for like a natural problem with 3SAT, but like you can show, in fact, Manuel Blum like proved this in like the 60s. That's the kind of stuff they were doing in the 60s. Uh, <laughs> construct some super crazy language that have this property that like, they have exactly this kind of property. So they're utterly insane, like, you know, you know, the task, like, what you need to do depends a lot on, I don't know, the input length and, like, like the, yeah, it's crazy. Sorry, what was your question? Well, okay. There's a person directly behind you, yeah. Yeah, that's true. If you remember that from 251, like the running time for, that's a good example, for multiplication, you know, like you have, there's an n squared algorithm and there's a Karatsuba's algorithm that runs in time n to the log base 2 of 3 and that, that's based on like a trick of dividing the words into two parts, but then there's another algorithm where you divide the words into three parts and you get n to the log base 5 of 9 or something. 
And then if you do the trick of dividing the word into four parts, you get like n to some faster number. So yeah, that's a good example. It's not inconceivable that you just design a sequence of algorithms that like each one is faster than the previous one. But yeah, it's possible. Did you have a question? So, oh, OK, great, same idea. Yeah, so uh, that's crazy. So actually, Ladner heroically nevertheless proved the theorem that like just assuming p does not equal np, you can prove the theorem. But like the proof is like much crazier. You have to like have like a diagonalization argument that sort of simultaneously works against all possible running times for three sat, and it's a little crazy. So I'm not going to do that because I think this proof gives you the idea, and like this situation is extremely unlikely. And if you believe the exponential time hypothesis, then just the first proof it works. Great. Okay. Any more questions? Uh, feedback is not in due to the due to the sum function of n, some some polynomial function of n. That's and, and then you try to solve the problem, it's fine. But you can't assume that. So what can you not assume? So like if, if, if you give me an arbitrary function, right? And then you say, yeah, feedback is not in two to the power f of n. Does this mean we can't design a proof that adjusts the padding to I don't know accommodate for that f of n? Yeah, I mean, I guess the point is if you tell me that like 3 sat, if you tell me that 3 sat, if you tell me an f of n such that 3 sat is not in time n to the f of n, or this is like anything that grows faster, this is like super constant. It's so anything that goes to infinity as n goes to infinity. If you tell me an explicit function such that 3 sat has this property, and, uh, but also like it's not too far from the truth, so that like 3 sat can also be solved in time not much more than this, then you can get the conclusion of Ladner's theorem. But like it could be that 3 sat is not in P, but there is no function like this. That's like the situation that could happen here. It's crazy, but like, could be possible. All right, so that's Ladner's theorem. Um, good. So it's a, a nice complexity theorem. And I want to tell you another nice complexity theorem, this Mahaney's theorem. And you know, I think the Mahaney's theorem is of medium interest. It's not the most important theorem in complexity theory, but I want to tell it to you because it answers some interesting questions about p versus np. It's also just another example of like a non-trivial proof in complexity theory, which I think we haven't seen too many. We saw the time hierarchy theorem, maybe Cook's Levin theorem, Ladner's theorem. All right, so now we're going to see uh, Mahaney's theorem. This is from the 80s, 1982. Okay, so it involves a definition. Let's say a language L is sparse. Basically, if it doesn't contain too many strings, so if L intersects 0, 1 to the n, this is all the strings in L of length n, if this is at most a uh, polynomial in n. OK, so a language can have any number of strings of length n up to like 2 to the n. And we'll say it's sparse if actually for every length it has at most polynomially many strings. So it's a language with very few strings in it. So that's quite unlike a lot of languages we're used to. Uh, I don't know, like most languages actually that you naturally write down have like exponentially many strings in them of length n. Anyway, so here's some questions. You know, after you, you know, learn about p and np completeness and so forth, and the fact that you know, that probably cannot be solved in polynomial time. Here are some questions that you might wonder about that are sort of on the theme of like maybe sat is sort of almost in p. That would be great. So what could you maybe mean by that? Here's the question. Maybe there exists uh, an algorithm A uh, solving sat correctly and running in polynomial time. on almost all inputs. Okay, so it's a sad algorithm that uh, actually always solves the problem, and it just 
super occasionally solves, uh, takes more than, I don't know, n squared time. If that were the case, then that would be kind of great, right? And you'd say, well, okay, maybe 3 sat, or sat is hard, but it's practically in polynomial time, if this were possible. And what do I mean by almost all? Let me specify it by saying uh, the language of L of strings x such that A of x takes more than poly time, whatever this time is, is sparse. Okay, so if this were possible, then that would be kind of, um, you know, counter-argument to the claim that SAT is a hard problem. You know, maybe there's some algorithm that gets it right and runs on polynomial time only on, like, you know, exponentially small number of strings. Or you could kind of uh, take a similar idea, but trade the correctness in time. So, like, maybe there exists an algorithm A solving SAT correctly uh, on almost all inputs. and always running on polynomial time. So that would be a, like a different way in which SAT might be considered almost like de facto easy despite being NP-complete if, you know, there's some algorithm that just always ran on polynomial time, like n squared time, and it didn't quite decide SAT, but like it almost decided SAT. So what I mean by this would be that, like, uh, the set of x in, in uh, let's say, x set of x, where a of x is wrong about whether or not x is in sat, is sparse. So, like, very few strings does a get it wrong. If either of these two situations were the case, then, you know, it'd be a little bit funny. You might say, well, yes, we just proved that 3 sat is NP-complete, and so it's probably not in P, but, oh, it's almost in P. Well, you know, complexity is always about negative things, so somehow this Mahaney's theorem implies, like, no. So assuming P does not equal NP. Okay, so Mahaney's theorem actually does not say, like, question two or possibility two is impossible, question one is impossible. I'll tell you what Mahaney's theorem is in one second. Uh, but once you prove Mahaney's theorem, you can deduce that these two things are impossible. I won't show you that deduction in class because it would take more time than I have. I'll just tell you what Mahaney's theorem actually is and prove it. But, you know, the motivation for Mahaney's theorem is that, you know, it rules out these two possibilities. So somehow it shows that, you know, something being NP-hard, like, really means it's hard. You can't just like solve it almost always correctly and efficiently. Okay, so let me actually tell you what Mahaney's theorem literally is. It's a similar statement that involves the words sparse and NP-complete. And it's just this. Uh, here it is. Assume P does not equal NP, otherwise everything's actually in polynomial time. Then there does not exist a sparse NP-complete language. Okay, that's Mahaney's theorem. That's what I'll prove. And as I said, it's not obvious why this theorem implies that these two situations are impossible, but take my word for it that if I had another half an hour, I could tell you why that's the case. So instead, we'll just prove the basic theorem. And it's kind of interesting in and of itself. It says, you know, let's assume this. It says an NP-complete language, any NP-complete language, cannot be sparse. It cannot just have like a very small number of strings in it. You know, basically any NP-complete language has to have uh, a lot of strings in it, a lot of you know yes instances, a lot of no instances. Okay, so this is the kind of thing that like they were wondering about in the early '80s when NP-completeness was kind of a new topic, and this is what we'll show. And the proof is like a little bit tricky. So I mean, it's not very tricky, but it's an interesting theorem, uh, interesting proof. Any questions about the statement? OK. Uh, great. So how are we going to prove this? 
Um, well, we'll prove the contrapositive. So we'll assume that there is a sparse NP-complete language and deduce that P equals NP. So let's suppose that L is magically uh, sparse and NP hard. Actually, I could have even written NP hard here. That's even better. Uh, we'll show P equals NP. In fact, I'll show that uh, I'll show that sad is NP. Okay, so let me tell you the outline or the idea of what we're trying to show here. We're imagining that there's this strange language L. It's NP hard, so any language like sad or anything uh, can be reduced to this language L. But L has this weird property that it only has like you know n to the 10 strings in it at, of length n, or n to the 20 or something. So that's very unusual, and somehow we're going to use that crazy fact to give a polynomial time algorithm for set. Okay. So okay. So let's let's just uh, take the two assumptions that we have: L is sparse and L is NP hard, and like write down what they mean a little bit more precisely. So. We have that L is sparse. Okay, so by definition, let's just say that uh, say L, when you look at length n strings, and let me write capital N here. Let's say this is at most n to the s. Okay, for all n. Okay, where s is a constant. S stands for sparse. So the thing of s is like 10 or something. Okay, so that's what we know. And the only other fact we know is L is NP hard. So that means there's a reduction from SAT to L. And uh, it's via some polynomial time reduction R. And um, let's say that R. When you give it a formula phi, it outputs some string uh, that's in L if and only if phi is satisfiable. And it's at most polynomial length in the length of phi. So let me just give a name to that too. Let's say this is at most the length of phi to the little r, where little r is some other constant. Okay, so this reduction takes uh, strings, formulas you're trying to decide if they're in sad, blows them up by a polynomial factor length to the r. OK, and R is also polynomial time. OK, and let me draw a picture here of uh, the situation. So let me this denote this by, this is bubble denotes all the strings of length n. And um, some of the strings, uh, we're considering strings phi of length n. We don't know if phi is in sat. Some of these strings are in sat, so this is sat. This is sat complement, all the strings that are not in sat. And this r, uh, this reduction, takes a formula phi and outputs a string in 0, 1 to the r. So it's bigger, little r. Um, and l has very few strings here. So here's L down here. I want to draw it big enough so that you can see it, but like it's extremely small. Okay, so uh, the number of strings here is at most, what is it at most? Yeah. Uh, it does have an R and an S in it. There's also an N in it, too. Oh, sorry, this is, sorry. I should have said N to the R. So that probably fixes, yeah. Sorry, that was a mistake by me. It takes length N strings to length N to the R strings. And like plugging little N to the R in for capital N here, we know that this is at most N to the R times S. 
So this is still a polynomial size. And this reduction has this weird property, right? It has to take every string in SAT into this tiny set, and every string, OK, every string not in SAT has to go to outside L. But it does have this like, weird property that like, it has to map all these SAT strings into this tiny little set L. OK. So uh, good. Now let me introduce a little bit of notation. Let capital T denote n to the r times s plus 1, like 1 bigger than the size of L. Now this proof I'm going to show, I'm now going to show that sat is in P, basically using the existence of this reduction r with this strange property. Um, it's a tricky proof. Like I cannot say, like, here's the very clear intuition for how it works. So I'm going to just start writing some true facts, and then we'll eventually use them to complete the proof. Um, so here is the kind of crucial fact. Suppose we have a bunch of SAT formulas, uh, Boolean formulas. Our Boolean formulas of length little n. And just consider what happens if I run the reduction on all of them. It's all just hypothetical. If I imagine I have like t Boolean formulas of length n. I imagine running the reduction on all of them. So I get t strings of length n to the little r. This is the, the key fact. There are two cases for what could happen. And in each case, something mildly interesting happens. So one possibility is that they're all distinct. So let's say I have these formulas. I run this reduction. I get a bunch of strings. And they happen to all be distinct. Well, then what do I know? By the pigeonhole principle, I guess, at least one, at least one of these strings is not in L. L is so small, and there's one more than the size of L here. And therefore, at least one of the strings is not in L. So that means that um, at least one of the size is unsatisfiable. One of these strings has to land outside L, and you know, that only happens when you give it when R is given a, a string that's not in SAT. Because right, R has the property that preserves the answer. If this is satisfiable, you land in L. If it's not, you land outside L. Uh -huh. Why is it the case that R of the two different Boolean formulas should give two different uh, It need not be the case. So I'm, I'm doing two cases here, and I'm, I've only done one. So one possibility when you run this is that all the strings happen to be distinct. In that case, you can do something a little bit interesting. You know that um, at least one of the size is unsatisfiable. OK? So somehow if you above like t formulas, you run all these reductions, and the, all the results ended up being distinct, you learn a little bit. At least one is unsatisfiable. The other possibility is that two are the same. Say uh, r of psi i happens to equal r of psi j, which, as was pointed out, is perfectly possible. If that happens, then you know that psi i and psi j have the same satisfiability status. OK. So uh, this is the basic trick that we're going to use in our overall algorithm that somehow magically solves SAT in polynomial time. And it just says whenever you have like enough formulas, capital T of them, then by using this reduction R and looking if you get all distinct outcomes or you get two the same outcomes, you learn a little something about size satisfiability status. Not a lot, but you, no matter what happens, you kind of learn something interesting. And that'll be just enough for us to like bootstrap and everything and solve SAT in polynomial time. Let me point out here that 
In the second case, you're the algorithm maybe that's using R. You see which I and J it is that produce the same string. So you know, in this case, you know I and J, and you know that phi, psi I and psi J have the same satisfiability status. In the first case, you don't know what this I is. You look at all the outcomes, they're all distinct. You're like, I now know at least one of them is unsatisfiable. I don't know which one, but at least one is. Okay, so that's an important thing to bear in mind. Here you know exactly which two guys have the same satisfiability status. Here you just learned that one of them is unset. Okay, so this, you know, the proof you can see is getting a little tricky. Don't let me erase this board either because this is like the crucial board for the whole proof. <coughs> okay, it still I, it should be like far from obvious like what, what's going to happen now? It's a tricky proof. Okay, but now I'll tell you, assuming the existence of uh, this L, this sparse L, which is NP-hard, the main thing that we got out of it is this polynomial time reduction R to this very sparse set, and this R, polynomial time reduction R has this weird but important property. Okay, so now we're going to solve sad in polynomial time. Okay, how are we going to do that? Let's say we're given a formula phi of length little n. What is this algorithm we're going to do to solve sat? Well, before I start, any, any question? Okay, so here's the idea. We're going to use the search to decision idea from last time. And this is also sort of far from obvious, but this is what we're going to do. So I'm describing an algorithm here for solving SAT that's going to use this capital R as a subroutine. And so I'm going to imagine sort of the tree that's generated when you try to figure out a potential satisfying assignment going bit by bit. So the algorithm starts, and it's got phi on its hands. And it say, hmm, I want to know if phi is satisfiable. So it's going to construct two formulas. It's going to construct phi with the first variable set to 0. And it's going to construct phi with the first variable set to 1. And it's going to sort of try to ask itself, hmm, I wonder if either of these guys is in SAT. And it still doesn't actually really know. So it's like, well, I was trying to decide if this is in SAT. Now I have to decide if these guys are in SAT. But the property is it knows if either of these guys is satisfiable, then it knows the original guy is satisfiable. If neither is satisfiable, then the original guy is not satisfiable. So it kind of needs to know the or of these two answers. But it doesn't know what to do, so it's going to actually keep building this tree. So it's going to say, all right, I could figure out the answer to this question if only I knew whether phi with x1 equals 0 and x2 equals 0 was in sat. And if I also knew whether phi with x1 equals 0 and x2 equals 1 was in sat. And similarly, I could branch on like x2 here. And get like two more formulas where if I could tell the satisfiability status of all of them, I'd be in good shape. OK, so things are not looking great for this algorithm so far. It can like keep doing this. It can keep branching and branching and branching until it gets down to formulas with like all the variables set, and then it's just true or false. And then it can eventually go all the way back and figure out if the original formula is satisfiable. But that's just a weird way to say, like, here's an algorithm that tries all possible assignments. So if it were to do that, it would run in exponential time. But um, some kind of cool miracle is going to occur where I can use this crucial fact involving R to prune a lot of the branches. So it's going to start doing this process. Uh, for a while and have like a lot of formulas at leaves. And uh, the key invariant of this algorithm is that 
the original formula is satisfiable if and only if at least one of the, let me call it open subformulas is satisfiable. Right, that's sort of the situation as you're going along. These are the ones that are at the least. I call them open, like to the algorithm. Whether or not these subformulas are satisfiable is like an open question. And the situation is always like, this guy is satisfiable if and only if at least one of these is satisfiable. If at least one is satisfiable, the original guy is satisfiable. If they're all unsat, then the original guy is unsat. OK, so here is the key claim in this proof. If the algorithm ever has more than t open subformulas, it can get rid of one and still maintain the invariant. Remember, t is like n to the rs, so it's like some polynomial bound. And this is kind of great. This is actually going to let the algorithms work in polynomial time. So it's going to keep doing this branching, branching, branching. And like, it's not going to go to polynomial time. It's going to go until it has t many unknown open formulas. And then by this claim, it can get rid of the one, prune it, and still be in the status that like, it just has to figure out whether or not there exists one of the open formulas that's satisfiable. And so then it can just keep going and keep branching, but like whenever it gets more than t open formulas, this claim lets it get back down to t. So if you think about it for like a couple minutes, you'll see that this actually lets the algorithm complete everything in polynomial time. It can just always maintain at most polynomially many open formulas and keep you know, branching on, on variables until it's got all the way down to you know, formulas with all the variables plugged in. So the consequence of this claim, which is the key claim, is that you can always have at most t plus 1, so that's n to the r times s plus 2, open formulas. And then you finish the tree in polynomial time. Okay, I didn't write 100% of the details here. I hope it's mostly clear that if this claim is true, then we're in good shape. Any question? Mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know if I know you can write the details, but I was just saying that uh, when we like, assign variables to the reduced band, or one way to think of it, the size of the circuit, the size of the problem, so the number might not be exactly t, but it's still problem. Yeah, this is a good point. And I actually tried to like cheat a little tiny bit, but now I will uncheat. It's true. So uh, uh, when you basically assign variables, in some sense, the formulas only get shorter. And sort of that's kind of OK, although we always talked about having length exactly n. But now like the formulas are going to have less a little, length a little bit less than n. Um, yeah, you can take care of that. In fact, there's like a little bit of a further problem, because actually you'll see in a second we're going to start talking about formulas of length 2 times n, which is actually bigger than n. But it's still fine, because you just, uh, here, I assume that you know, if this is n, then finally your bound is that t can be as n to the r times s plus 1. If this is 2n, then maybe it's like, maybe you have to insert like another factor of 2 to the rs here. But that's just a constant factor. So, yeah, I cheated a little bit by sort of like uh, going over the constant factors, but it doesn't affect things very much. But good point. OK, great. OK, everything is on the board now for the glorious conclusion. Um, good. So the last thing we have to prove is the claim. Then we'll have a polynomial time algorithm for set, assuming this reduction and assuming this sparse NP-complete set exists. And we'll prove Mahaney's theorem, and we're done.
And it's just like an amazing trick using uh, this, this board. OK, so proof of claim. OK, say the algorithm gets into a state where it has uh, more than t formulas open. OK, so I use indexing from 0 to capital T, so there's t plus 1 of these. OK, so now I'm going to tell you that algorithm can somehow get rid of one of them. It sort of knows that phi is in sat if and only at least one of these is satisfiable. And the algorithm is going to do a trick to get rid of one of them and still have the property. Well, here's what it does. It forms psi i to be, uh, OK, let me say, let psi 1 be phi 0 or phi 1. And let psi 2 be phi 0 or phi 2. And in general, let psi i be phi 0 or phi i. This is for i uh, between 1 and capital T. This is the magic step. Like, you know, who would think of this? I don't know, but this is the trick. Okay? So the algorithm, there's no special ordering on this either. It just picks one of them to be psi zero, phi zero, and then it just considers phi zero ord which e with each of the others. Now we're going to apply this fact, and like something lucky is going to happen. Here's uh, where I was cheating a little bit too. These psi's are of length, yeah, like maybe 2n plus 1 or something, because you've got to write down the or. So actually, Probably I should have, you know, if I put like n over 2 here, then it would be all kosher, but let me ignore that. Okay, so I'm describing what the algorithm does to get rid of one of them. So it forms these formulas, and then it, um, well, it runs capital R on each of them. So it computes R of psi 1 through R of psi t. Okay, t is polynomial, and R is polynomial time, and these have linear length, so all of this stuff is polynomial time. And now it just uh, does the two cases. So let's see what happens. Case one is they're all distinct. I mean, it just looks at what it gets and sees if they're all distinct. Okay. So what does the algorithm conclude? It concludes that at least one of the psi's is unset. So now the algorithm knows there exists an i such that this is between 1 and n, 1 and t, such that psi i is unsatisfiable. It doesn't know which one, though. But if psi i is unsat, let's say it's psi 2, then the or is unsat. That means phi 0 is unsat, because, I mean, if psi 0 is satisfiable, then the whole or would be satisfiable. So it doesn't know which i does the trick, but at this point it knows phi 0 is unsatisfiable. And it can get rid of psi 0, phi 0, and maintain this invariant. Right, the invariant says that uh, what you really care about is whether or not there's at least one phi that's satisfiable. And now it knows that phi 0 is unsatisfiable, so it can just Get rid of it. OK. Last possibility is that it, it runs the reduction on these t formulas and finds that some two of them are the same. And it's going to get rid of one of them. Uh, so we'll see why. So if two are the same, say it finds that um, we know that, say, psi, it learns that, let's say it knows that psi i and psi j have the same satisfiability status. OK, and remember in this case, it knows what i and j are. And the subclaim now is it's OK to drop either one of phi i or phi j. So it's OK to drop phi i. The proof of this is actually there's two cases. Why is that the case? One possibility is that phi 0 is satisfiable. 
again, the algorithm does not know this, but if it happens to be satisfiable, then by the invariant, the original phi is satisfiable. And just dropping psi i is OK. Because you're trying to maintain that phi is satisfiable, you're trying to maintain that your open formulas have at least one that's satisfiable, well, you're keeping phi 0. Why is hmm? phi 0 um, We're trying to reason about why it's OK to drop this one. And like, what, for whatever reason, it's a bit of a mystery proof. The, we case on whether phi zero is satisfiable or not. OK, I'm, I'm really done in like less than one minute. Case two, phi zero is unsatisfiable. Mm, in that case, you know, what we've deduced is we know that phi i is satisfiable if and only if phi j is satisfiable. That's what we learned here. But this is phi 0 or phi i. And this one is phi 0 or phi j. But in case 2, phi 0 is unsatisfiable. So um, this implies that phi i is satisfiable if and only if phi j is satisfiable. So the fact that r i, sorry, that psi i and psi j have the same satisfiability status, plus the assumption that phi zero is actually unsatisfiable, just means that phi i and phi j have the same satisfiability status. Which means that like in this invariant, like they're kind of redundant. Like you keep one and it doesn't change things. So it's okay to drop actually either one of them. And the invariant will be maintained. So that's the end of the proof. Sorry, it went a little bit over time and I rushed a little bit at the end. But you can check the video. Uh, okay, so see you on Tuesday.